ask your forgiveness for the fact that I am uh, muddy and stained and uh, bee stung, actually, because I came here straight from strawberry picking uh, <laughs> for the event I'm cooking tomorrow night. And my friend with whom I was picking looked across the road from me at one point, and she was like, how are you not in front of a mirror giving your speech right now? Why, why are you doing this? And I quoted the very end of a poem by uh, Mary Oliver called The Summer Day to her. And it goes, uh, tell me, what else should I have done? Doesn't everything die and too soon? Tell me, what is it you plan to do with your one wild and precious life? And she looked back at me, and she was like, OK, OK. All right, pick. So that's, that's what's going on with the boots. Um, <laughs> thanks. Uh, I'm paraphrasing Michael Pollan right now when he said that too often when we talk about the importance of local food, we talk about keeping farms in communities. And we talk about the experience of smelling our ingredients at farmers markets and seeing them and touching them. And we talk about the benefits to our society of narrowing the distance between producer and consumer. And that's all valid and it's all important. But when you stack it up next to the perceived convenience and the perceived uh, cheapness of supermarket food, it can all sound, let's be honest, a little sentimental. So I don't want to be sentimental. I want to be hard nosed. Let's talk economics. Let's talk specifically about uh, economies of scale. And you guys probably all know what that is, but if you happen to have spent microecon like I do, like I did, uh, doodling, then <laughs> here's a review. An economy of scale is an economic principle by which the cost of a unit produced goes down as the number of units go up. In other words, the more you make, the lower the cost of the thing you make. So if you're talking about cars, buy your car making machine once, and you make a lot of cars. They're less expensive because you only bought the machine once. When you turn on the car making machine, the more cars you make, the smaller a fraction of the energy surge each of the cars carry. Let's talk about it when it comes to food. We're going to do this through the two shopping baskets. Shopping basket number one, which uh, probably looks like the everyman shopping basket, right? It looks economical, cost efficient, convenient, uh, practical. Shopping basket number two. I bet that this looks more costly, um, less efficient, less convenient, and maybe elitist. Number one, perhaps the shopping basket of that father of efficiency, Henry Ford. Number two, the shopping basket of that mother of starry-eyed idealism, Alice Waters. But let's look more closely. Let's cook shopping basket number one, beginning with pre-packaged, pre, -packaged, pre more packaged pre-cooked beets, because my illustrator, Jill, likes painting packaged beets, and I like artistic freedom. Um, pre-cooked, peeled, hard-boiled eggs, boneless, skinless, mm, not true. Did, did you already see the chicken breast? Oh, so boneless, skinless chicken breast. Dinner. Cooked chicken breast, cooked sliced beets, a cooked egg. If there are four of you, all four can eat this. Because I'm not being sentimental, I'm not going to talk about what might have gotten lost in not smelling the cooking of the beets or not meditatively watching the bubbling water as your egg boils. I want to be hard nosed. I want to talk about units. So. How much else can we make? What else can we do with these ingredients? We know we can put an egg on a plate. It looks lonely uh, <laughs> and austere and maybe not that filling, 
but this is something we can do with our pre-cooked eggs. Last night I was talking at Shelburne Farms and I asked the audience what else we could do with what we had and they said egg salad. True, chop it up, make it into egg salad. That's a great idea. Then somebody else in the audience said frittata. And I had to say no, not a frittata because it's already cooked like that. You can't uncook it and scramble it. There's not that much else you can do with shopping basket number one. Wait, wait, there's leftovers. Hmm. It's kind of leftovers, right? There's a lot of packaging. And uh, if you're still hungry, then you just take these leftovers and you put them in a bag. You walk that bag to the curb. You put it in your garbage can. You get in your car. You drive to the supermarket. You stop to fill your car with gas. You get in uh, line, you pay for your grocery bill, you get back in your car, you drive home, uh, you know, rinse, repeat. Let's cook shopping basket number two. We have raw, dirty, inconvenient beets with their dirty greens and their stems still attached. We have raw eggs, which have to be cooked. We have an onion, because I couldn't find uh, a packaged onion for shopping basket number one. We have parsley because I couldn't find packaged parsley either. We have a meal. It's uh, homemade mayonnaise, which you make by whisking olive oil into egg yolks and uh, roasted beets with a little bit of raw onion tossed in for flavor and contrast and it's sprinkled with parsley. And uh, this is a beautiful meal, right? It's so beautiful that Jill, the illustrator, replaced my roasted onions with boiled potatoes because she was feeling inspired. Uh, but who cares about the beauty? Let's stay on track. What else can we make? Well, we have those raw eggs. Scramble some of them. Great. Even if you don't have Jill's asparagus. She's an artist. Well, we have those inconvenient beet stems. So we can just cut them off, stick them in a jar, heat up vinegar, pour the vinegar over, we have pickles. Not fermented, Sandra is later. But delicious. You know, this great snack, right? If you don't want to snack on it, uh, put it in a sandwich. Chop them up and put them in your scrambled eggs if you don't have your own illustrator. We have the actual leaves from the beets. Saute them in olive oil, it takes about five minutes, crack an egg, fry it in another pan, put it on top, dinner. Mm, what now? Parsley stems, garbage. Onion peels, more garbage. We still have a chicken. No, I don't know why I did with a chicken, but there's a chicken. Um, why don't we put the chicken in a pot with that edible garbage, fill the pot with water, and boil it. Then we'll end up with boiled chicken, which we can eat with parsley oil made from more parsley leaves, which we have left over, chopped up, mixed with olive oil. Sounds pretty good, right? Surely we're done now. This is going on and on. I don't know. There's still a chicken carcass. Get your hands dirty by picking out those little pieces of meat that cling to carcasses. And then mix some of them with leftover mayonnaise, which you still have from the first meal. Make a chicken sandwich. If there's still a tiny bit of picked off chicken left, make Gary a taco. OK, now we're done. Right, for sure. This is we have a lot of units. The girl has made her point. There's all the chicken stock, though, and it would be such a shame to let it go to waste. Um, of course, you made it just by boiling the chicken. So you can put some noodles in some of it. Cook the noodles. You have noodle soup. Chop up some vegetables. Put it in more chicken stock. You have vegetable. If there's a cup of chicken stock left, heck, if there's a half a cup of chicken stock left, then you combine it with some water, stir it into 
rice for 20 minutes and have risotto. But the original input costs of basket two are higher. Maybe they're twice as high. About four or five times as many meals. The cost of basket one starts to rise. Time is money. Boiling a chicken takes time. It takes an hour. Divided over four meals, each is 15 minutes a meal. Sauteing beet greens takes five minutes. Cooking noodles in stock takes nine minutes. Uh, chopping up vegetables in a food processor and sticking them in soup, letting them cook, takes 12. This is less time that you spend getting in your car and going to and from the grocery store. The cost of basket one skyrockets. And speaking of cost, what about the ones you don't see on your grocery bill, but your kids will see in their lifetimes, like the cost of dealing with landfill overflow from the food packaging, or the cost of biomass and topsoil loss caused by industrial farming, or the cost of dealing with the pollution of uh, waste from large confined animal feeding operations that a lot of our packaged meat comes from when it leaches into our water supply. Now the cost of basket one is astronomical. Wendell Berry has a great uh, thing. Wendell Berry has so many great things. But one in particular that he has said that always uh, has stuck with me is that when we took animals off of farms and put them in confined animal feeding operations, we took an old and elegant solution to the problems of fertility and animal waste, which were uh, animals eat crops and they fertilize them while they do it, um, and divided it into two problems, where we have to fertilize our soil with synthetic fertilizers and we have to deal with animal waste on these farms. When we take the messy, inconvenient, inefficient, leaves and stems and peels and bones out of our food, when we take the cooking out of our food, we take the old elegant solution of how to feed ourselves affordably and responsibly and well, which is buying and using the whole local food, which just happens to also be the food from which you can get the most meaning that cost of each unit goes down and separated it into two problems, where by you end up with a shopping basket full of food that does cause long-term harm and also doesn't give you bang for your buck. So I guess the question is, which really is more efficient, basket one or basket two? Which really is economical? And which would Henry Ford choose? 